Welcome everyone. To view live captions for in English and Spanish, please click on the external link we've dropped in the chat. And for our guests watching on YouTube, the link to closed captions in English and Spanish is in the video description below. We are so glad to have you with us this morning, morning for an up close look at some of our favorite fossil finds discovered right here in the middle of Los Angeles. My name is Becca and I work with the education team at La Brea Tarpet. And as you can probably tell, I'm not at the museum right now. I'm actually at home, like many of you. But we do have some amazing staff that still need to go into the museum to help take care of our excavation sites and fossils. And as I mentioned, we'll try to get to as many questions as we can. And Laura might answer a lot of them during her presentation. But if we don't get to answer your question today, I encourage you to write it down so you can learn more about that fossil on your own. So if you'd like, grab a piece of paper and a pencil so you can record your experience while you're watching today. You can note down any of those questions you have, maybe a few facts you learned, or draw or write a description of what the fossil looks like. And we love fan art of our fossils, so if you have a picture you'd like to share with your teacher, they're welcome to email it to the school programs team. All right, so to give you an idea of where Laura is joining us from today, I wanna share this map of Hancock Park with you. If you visited our museum before, this may look a little familiar. So our museum is this box over here. And Laura is just on the other side of the park in Project 23, right over here. All right. So Laura Tewksbury is one of our fossil preparators at the museum, and she has an awesome fossil find that she's going to share with you today. So let's get started. Hey, Laura, how are things at Project 23 this morning? Things are good. A little bit noisy construction in the background, but hopefully everyone will be cool with that. We are in the middle of a very busy city. And again, I'm not wearing a mask right now just because I'm outside and not close to any other people and make it easier for us to talk today. But otherwise, I think we can go ahead and slither our way on into today's presentation. Okay, so... So yes, thank you, Becca. And thank you everyone for joining us today. Um, so today we have, we have many different reptiles and potentially in the future, we'll talk about more of these, but today we're focusing on the ophidians or these snakes that we have here at the tar pits. And so we have about a dozen different species that we've recognized here so far, but I will mention that because snake fossils are relatively small and historically speaking, weren't as focused on, I really expect that in the next many years, we will find more and more information about our snakes. Um, so today we're just gonna do kind of a general overview about the things that we know. But in case any of you want to come research snakes in the future, I'm just throwing it out there. There's a lot to still do, come on over. So most of the snakes that we're looking at are like this one that's at the top of the image here uh, in the Colubridae family of snakes, uh, which makes sense that most of our snakes are within there because about two thirds of all snakes are in that family. Um, but we also do have one other family, the Vipiridae family, and so that's the vipers, just like this rattlesnake here. And so we'll be talking about uh, both groups of snakes as we continue this presentation. And we can go ahead and move on to the next slide because many of you may have seen some of our snakes before, either digitally or in person, especially with some of our live animal programs that we have over at our sister museum, the Natural History Museum of Los Angeles County. And so a lot of that outreach is done with a variety of many different snakes. And many of those snakes are kinds that we still find here at the tar pits. But I also just picked this particular one because I thought it was really pretty. So uh, I also wanna remind you that not only do we have those snakes still living in this area today, but we find their fossils as well. And so here we have um, my coworker, Karen, holding a little piece of a snake jaw that she found. And so this one, it's one of those where the easiest way for us to tell the difference between a lizard jaw and a snake jaw is that those teeth that you can see, see how they're relatively hooked? They're almost like a, like a cresting wave kind of shape. Well, that's because snakes don't have hands. And one of the easiest ways to try to eat something is to have your teeth help direct the food down your throat. So that's part of the reason why they have those very distinctive hooks. So when we see those, we can be like, oh, even if we're only finding a tiny little fragment of a jaw, we can still know that it's from a snake when we see those hooks. And uh, on this next picture, we can see, again, one of my coworkers in the laboratory, Connie, found another chunk of a snake jaw. And the front ones are a little broken, but you can see across these three back ones, again, those very dramatic hooks 
that help direct that food down its throat when it doesn't have any hands to help it do that. But let's talk about some of the specific snakes that we have here. Um, and so um, a lot of the pictures that I'm gonna be using are of snakes that are currently alive or that uh, have taken pictures of around Los Angeles. But these are all types of snakes that we find fossils of here as well. This particular one is a king snake. Uh, this particular one was, uh, the picture was taken about four miles just south of where I am right now. So just in my neighborhood. And king snakes are really interesting because they specialize in eating other snakes. So, you know, if you're something like a rattlesnake, you wanna watch out for these. So again, some snakes even eat other snakes, not just rodents, but some do specialize in other food, uh, like these next ones that we're going to look at. So these ones are garter snakes. And um, I think they're really pretty. And I also love this particular photo because again, it shows uh, one of the main uh, types of environments that these garter snakes love to hunt in, and that is water and aquatic settings. And that's probably part of the reason that these garter snakes are one of the most common snakes that we find fossils of here at the tar pits. Many of our other species, things like freshwater snails and western pond turtles, are all supporting of having, you know, ponds and streams here at the tar pits for tens of thousands of years, and a lot of those fossils uh, I love things like these garter snakes adding another piece of that puzzle to support the evidence we see from our geology, showing that we had stream channels coming down off the nearby Santa Monica mountains here periodically across tens of thousands of years. And so when we find these species that love water, again, it's just another piece of that puzzle building an understanding of what it was like in a particular place at a particular time, even though it was a long time ago for us now. And uh, so they love hunting aquatically, but some others are more land-based like this one that my friend Leslie is holding. So this one is a gopher snake and gopher snakes uh, themselves are again, Colubridae family snakes. So they're not rattlesnakes, but a lot of their patterning tends to be very similar to a rattlesnake. And part of the reason that they do that is to be like, hey predators, don't mess with me. I'm a scary, scary rattlesnake. I could really hurt you, but I mean, they're not but they look enough like one that anything that's like, oh, I'm not gonna mess with a rattlesnake, will just glance at a gopher snake and be like, oh, I'm not gonna mess with that rattlesnake, even though they're a completely different type of snake. So very, very clever disguise on the part of the gopher snake. And uh, that's actually part of an exhibit that's inside of our nature lab that's open uh, now at the Natural History Museum, our sister museum downtown is reopened. Uh, one of the exhibits that you can go visit there is actually understanding some of the differences uh, if you were to glance at one between a rattlesnake and a gopher snake, since they do look so similar. Um, but again, the main thing is to give it space, whichever kind of snake it is, but we'll get more into that later. And so we've talked about a lot of the different Colubridae family snakes, but let's get back to those rattlesnakes. Because especially this time of year, they're kind of the ones that we talk about the most because they're so commonly seen in our area especially when we have like the, the May gray and the June bloom weather that's already burnt off today. Uh, especially at that time where it's burning off is the time that you're most likely to see these snakes out basking, getting some of their sun to give them energy to digest their food and that sort of thing. And so rattlesnakes are all under the genus Crotalus. And Crotalus is from a Greek word Crotalin that means rattle or castanet. And I don't like rattle as much personally because a rattle is usually a musical instrument made out of putting a lot of tiny things into a larger container to shake it. And the tiny things inside being shaken is what makes the noise. I prefer castanets like these musical instruments that I have a picture of here because those ones are made of hard things that clap together very quickly to make that noise, which is more what it's like on the inside of a rattlesnake's rattle. That's more what's making that noise is hard things clapping against each other instead. Um, but fun fact, those pieces, those, uh, those rattles are actually um, keratin. So the same kind of thing that your fingernail is made out of. So uh, it's more kind of like snapping your nails. We'll move on. Castanets are a better example. And uh, so we have about seven different species of rattlesnake that live here in Los Angeles area today. And this is one of those. And I just really like this picture also because, again, it almost looks like it's playing peekaboo with you. And so again, there are seven different species in this area and uh, rattlesnakes in general are pretty widely spread types of snakes. They're found all the way from Southern Canada, all the way down into Northern Argentina. So again, it's one of those things that, uh, 
you know, has been around here for a very long time and continues to do pretty well for itself in a relatively large area where we're having these particular types of environments. And in this next picture, we have one that's over in our nature lab that I mentioned earlier. And in case anyone's like, oh my goodness, he's eating a mouse. I will remind you that I eat hamburgers and I didn't put a picture of myself eating a hamburger in here. I could have, but everybody's got to eat something. And if those uh, snakes weren't eating a lot of those rice and other mice and other rodents, then there would be way, way, way too many rodents. And that would be its own separate, different, horrible problem. So appreciate those snakes helping to keep those populations down and more stable and more balanced. But the other reason I liked this particular photo is that you can see that even though it's a relatively large snake, I wanna remind you that the bulk of that belly that you're actually seeing is made out of the vertebrae or the spine that runs down it. The same kind of bones that you have in your body, uh, vertebrae and ribs, but at the same time, they just have a lot more than you do. And they're gonna be a little bit different shaped but the overwhelming majority of the shape of that body is just made out of that central spine, those vertebrae, and those ribs kind of helping make support structures along that snake. But so when people are like, oh, when you're digging, like how come you find so many snake vertebrae and ribs? And I was like, because every single snake has a lot of them. So statistically, you're much more likely to find that particular fossil. And uh, I actually have a picture of one of those from a rattlesnake here at La Brea. And so um, it's a picture of me holding it and uh, it's most likely a rattlesnake just due to its size, but I'll wait for my coworkers inside the laboratory to finish cleaning it to finally confirm that. But again, I get asked a lot, like, how do you know what you're looking at? And I will say that one of the main things that's helpful to me is practice. I see vertebrae like this a lot. Uh, I actually have the, the next slide has another picture of one that was found as part of our La Brea Webs project. Um, and again, so you can see those same types of shapes over and over. And then in this next slide, we can again see those same types of shapes over and over again. So a lot of that is that practice. And then in this next slide, we see another one. So again, uh, a lot of how I can know, like even what this tiny little thing is, is just by seeing these same shapes over and over again. And one of the things for me that makes it very easy to tell that it's a snake specifically. So if you notice the very, very round part on the bottom, that's the part of the spine that helps connect kind of the conga line of the spine together. And it's so very round and it's very similar to parts in your body, like your uh, shoulder joint or your hip joint, areas that you need more of like a ball and socket because you need a lot of flexibility and rotation, but you don't need this kind of flexibility in your spine. So your vertebrae don't look more like this, they're much flatter. But snakes, again, to be able to do that very sinuous type of motion that they do, need to have a lot of that flexibility in their spine. And that's why even the pieces of their spine where they connect are more like ball and socket, so they can really have a lot of flexibility. And I just think that's really pretty. So thank you. And uh, on one of these last slides, I just, again, want to remind, uh, at least when I grew up, I was very, very worried about snakes from all of the adults in my area. And I just wanna remind everybody that yes, you should definitely treat them with respect, but at the same time, it's more important to be careful on a ladder and get lots of exercise to protect your body and keep it strong and healthy. So the amount of times that you're likely to die by coming in contact with a venomous snake or a lizard is very, very small. So again, of all of the things to worry about, worry about it less than a lot of other things. It's just my little takeaway, which I then have on our uh, next slide as well. This is a comment um, from our specialist over at the Natural History Museum who focuses mostly on our uh, reptiles. And again, uh, this is from a particular blog post that he did kind of again, reminding everybody that if you see a venomous snake, leave it alone, give it some space. If you give it enough space and you feel like taking a picture, that's cool. Go ahead and enter it into some of our research projects that we'll put the links in the description and in the chat right now as part of the uh, reptiles and amphibians of Southern California research project. Um, that again, we're pulling from everybody to try to contribute things to that. But the main thing is, is these are just other animals just living their life. And I personally think that they're beautiful. So um, if we wanna move along to our next slide, I just wanna remind everybody to treat all wild animals with respect 
give them space. Don't try to mess with them. Enjoy how beautiful they are because everything deserves its respect, whether it has fur or feathers or scales. So thanks everybody for letting me talk to you about snakes. Awesome, thank you so much, Laura. This was so cool. I love how you described the snake vertebrae like a conga line that just, it sounds so fun when you think about it in that way. And we have so many great questions from our students. Let's dive right in, shall we? Absolutely. All right. So Sabrina was wondering, um, you were talking, you showed us those images of the um, vertebrae of the rattlesnakes and the other snakes. Um, and she's wondering if they're always black in color and if they are and why, um, because they're familiar with their bones being white when they're alive. So that was kind of um, interesting observation. Absolutely. So I actually have some that are in a piece of jewelry that was sustainably got. But so these are some snake vertebrae that I have in a bracelet that I have. And again, you can see all of those same shapes, but this bone is white because this is from a modern snake. Um, our fossils here at the tar pits tend to have that beautiful La Brea brown black color to them because they are preserved through the tens of thousands of years by asphalt or crude oil that gets into all the tiny little spaces of the bone and helps protect the bone, but then also changes the color when we look at it. So modern snake bones, you would see that same white color that your bones are, but it's only when they're preserved in asphalt for tens of thousands of years that that color changes. Oh, wow. That's awesome. Thanks, Laura. Absolutely. Um, okay. So you mentioned also snakes have those cool teeth that help them eat when they don't have hands, but how do these snakes move if they don't have arms or legs? Oh, thank you so much for asking because I actually have a, a piece from a, a friend snake of mine. So again, this is a modern snake. Uh, this is not a fossil because we don't find these types of fossils. But if you notice, so this is the, the skin from the back of the snake's body. And you can see the scales are very regular, but relatively small. When we look at the scales from the belly, you see how much bigger those are? That's part of the way that they're able to do what they do is by using those very large belly scales to kind of help them clamber and climb around and have very even pressure. So uh, they're very, very efficient climbers. They can climb uh, trees, they can climb brick walls, they can climb a cactus. Uh, but all of that is just due to the very specific shape of those belly uh, scales that they have, which you can see even once they take off that outer layer of skin. That's amazing. Wow. I love that. Thank you so much for sharing it, for sharing that with us. Absolutely. Um, <laughs> uh, Sophia is wondering, um, how old are the snake fossils that you find at the tar pit? Uh, so we're finding them amidst all of the other fossils that we're finding. So we're finding them mostly between about 10 to 50,000 years old. Uh, most of the ones I showed today were probably in more of the 30 to 50,000 years old because most of the fossils that I showed today are from Project 23 specifically. And most of our fossils from this one across the different boxes are in more of that 30 to 50,000 year old range. So again, wow. they've, been, they've been here even before we were. Wow, that's amazing. I, I love that. Um, okay, Miss Amador's class has a lot of aspiring paleontologists and archaeologists, and they're wondering if there are still a lot of fossils to be found at the tar pits. So like if they were to come work at the tar pits, um, would they be able to find anything? Is there anything left to dig up? Um, so I will say, yes, there are a lot. Um, usually we have a volunteer program that's currently on hiatus right now while we're figuring out how to do it safely and responsibly. Um, but normally the overwhelming majority of the people that I work with are volunteers that come from our community. Uh, to work inside the laboratory with my teammates, you have to be at least 16. To work out here with me is about 18. Um, but otherwise I have from you know 18 to late 70s, uh, a wide variety of people and many with paleontology and archeology span backgrounds, but I also have you know crossing guards and retirees and all sorts of things. Um, so I always want more help. Yes, please. Um, and if you aren't quite there age-wise yet, I'll still have plenty to work to do then. Because so Project 23, so this is one of the boxes of Project 23, one of the smaller ones. So these are entire sections of earth that came out when they were building the underground parking garage next door to us. And there were so many fossils that they ended up just building boxes around the entire sections of earth 
and moving them over to our side of the park so that we can still go through them, organize and preserve as much context as possible while it, enabling them to finish their construction in a reasonable time scare. Um, but uh, it's one of those where this project was originally said that it was going to be five years starting in August of 2008. It's taken a bit more than that. I was not the one to make the original estimate or I would have given something a little bit more reasonable. Um, but at the same time, even just with the number of fossils that we still have today, we have a lot of work to do. And then even once we're done out here, there's more work to do with our teammates in the laboratory because this, at the point at which that we give them to them is not the, the end result that's ready to be researched yet. So yes, please come volunteer, thank you. That's so exciting. I love that we have so much work to do and we've done so much already, right? Over the last hundred years, but there's still easily a hundred more years of work to be done. So Miss Amador's class, I hope to see you all soon helping us out, digging up these bones. Um, awesome, okay, so Sophie's wondering, where do you find most of your fossils? You were mentioning, you know, the box behind you. Is there another location that we, that we can find, find these fossils? Absolutely, so Project 23 is the main full-time excavation uh, that's going on right now. And it's called Project 23 because we got 23 of these really large boxes that came over when we started working on them. The one I'm working on particularly right now is the very, very end of box 14, so 14 of 23. Um, and even just the last bit, but I can, it's a, it's a small enough area that I can actually hug it. And just in that area, just, you know, within about the last year or so, um, with a little, a little extra, in a normal year, I would find even just specifically snake vertebrae, I found enough that I couldn't hold it in two hands. Like that's how many I found just in that particular area. So we have a lot of fossils still to go, um, but Project 23 is our main excavation site because these are the ones that are currently most at risk. These have been taken out of that situation that's been protecting them for tens of thousands of years. So this is really where our main focus is, is to get these fossils as safe as possible, as soon as possible. Oh, cool. Um, kind of along those lines of where we find the fossils, Maiden is also wondering, how do you know where to look in the ground to find them, to find the fossils? Uh, so right now we aren't necessarily looking in any particular places on purpose because we have so much to do, but usually the kinds of things is looking for areas um, that fossils have been found in the past because again there's been over a century of excavations here at the Tarpits, um, and also areas where asphalt is already coming up to the surface because uh, overwhelmingly the bulk of what we're actually digging through is sands and rocks and silts and clays so we're digging through dirt but uh, the main protective situation for those fossils is asphalt. So we'll usually start by looking for areas where there's asphalt that's in sands and rocks and silts and clays and that sort of thing. So that's usually the first place that we would want to check. Oh, awesome, that's so exciting that it's kind of just a mystery and you're, you cross your fingers when you start digging and hope you find something cool, but you know you're gonna find a lot of cool dirt. <laughs> that's awesome. Um, so moving on from the excavation process, you talked a little bit about, you have some colleagues in the lab that help you out. Um, and Sabrina is wondering, how does the lab confirm if the fossil that you find is a vertebrae of a snake? And you know, is there a process that they follow that you can, that you can help us out with? Absolutely. So uh, it was exposed enough that I was pretty comfortable saying that just with how much that I had already uncovered. But again, there was still a lot of that sand mixed with asphalt that was still stuck to it, which I like because it'll help protect that vertebrae until my coworkers in the laboratory can work on it. Um, but what they'll do is they'll use a series of delicate tools and uh, chemicals to help just separate those asphaltic sands off of that fossil, off of the outside edges. And then what they can do to confirm a particular species of snake and that sort of thing is that we have a basically a library of bones that we can compare it to as well, called our comparative collection. So they can go through and be like, oh, okay, you know, it has that really round ball and socket, you know, type centrum on that vertebrae. But, uh, you know, let's look at this particular shape or the way that this particular process kind of boink, sticks out a little bit and let's compare it with all the different snakes that we have and see which one it matches. So. We, we have a library of bones is the way that I phrase it. That's so cool. So it's just a lot of teamwork and a lot of observation trying to figure out to make sure you make the right identification of that fossil. 
That's so cool. Uh, awesome. Thank you. Uh, let's see. Kelsey is also wondering, she's got a couple questions. What is the tar made of? And then what, can you explain the difference between um, bones, like the one you showed us on your, on your bracelet and fossils, like the pictures that you were showing us? Absolutely. Uh, so tar here at the tar pits is technically asphalt, which is the crudest form of naturally occurring oil. All of Los Angeles Basin is actually a series of oil fields. This is just an area where that oil has been coming up through cracks in the ground to the surface for tens of thousands of years. Um, it also comes up with lighter grades of oil like methane, which is why you get those bubbles that come up sometimes too, because you have the, the bubbles of methane coming up through the thicker, more viscous asphalt. Um, and uh, I completely forgot the second question. I'm so sorry. No problem. The second question was, how, what's the difference between the bones that you showed us from, from your bracelet that you said were from a modern snake and fossils that you find of snakes? So kind of what's the difference between a bone and a fossil? Absolutely. So a fossil is just any evidence of ancient life, period. So a fossil is a wide variety of things. It can be things that are still chemically bone, like our fossils that are preserved in asphalt that are still chemically made of the same original materials like collagen and that sort of thing that original bones are made out of. Um, but it also could be things like insects and amber or things like uh, permineralized bone, like most dinosaur bones that are uh, chemically turned into rocks by usually water moving through and replacing the original minerals with other minerals and kind of making a coffee made out of stone. Um, it could be things like impressions of leaves. It could be all sorts of things. So fossils, a very wide variety, but our particular type of asphaltically preserved fossils are usually, again, um, uh, hard tissues, things like bone, teeth, sticks, uh, insect exoskeletons, freshwater snail shells, that sort of thing that asphalt uh, helps preserve as that original organic uh, material. So we don't get any of that soft tissue, we don't get any flesh or fur, uh, but we do get those hard tissues from uh, both animals and plants. Oh, cool. Thank you. That, that makes a lot more sense now. We can kind of see the difference. Like bones can be fossils, but they're not always fossils. So awesome. Um, okay, we've got so many amazing questions. Um, I have, let's, I think we have time for maybe two more questions. Um, Angelique is wondering why snakes don't have arms and legs and how do they survive without them? Uh, so snakes have a, just a line of ancestry of very, very specialized evolution in which uh, the way I kind of, you know, paraphrase it as like use it or lose it. It's one of those things that, uh, you know, certain ones of their ancestors you know, started moving around in very particular ways and it did very well for the amount of energy it took them to get energy versus the amount of energy it took them to make babies. So they made a lot of babies and passed on that genetics and that type of thing continued through time. And again, we're talking about many, many millions of years, um, but you can even see some lizards. Uh, that's another place that I recommend you go do a little bit more research on as well. Um, there are some lizards that are legless lizards. They're not technically snakes, but again, it's one of those things where you know, that particular body plan is very efficient because especially if you want to like get down into a rodent burrow and, uh, you know, really efficiently, if you want to climb a tree really efficiently, like snake bodies are really efficient. So a lot of that is, again, just that combination of, you know, it, it did its job really well and they may, they had enough babies across millions of years that that's the kind of body shape that continued. Um, and uh, I just can't hold on to anything. There was another part to that. I'm so sorry. I think you got it. Um, they oh, were just perfect. kind of wondering how they're able to survive without arms and legs, but it, it, you, you totally answered that. It's just how that how this animal has evolved and adapted. And it's got, like you mentioned, the, those hook teeth that help it, even though it doesn't have arms or hands, those teeth still help it to um, ingest that food, which is the coolest thing I've ever seen. Um, thank you for that one. I, we have time for one more question and I'm so sorry if we didn't get to to ask your question today. I hope you write it down and keep it for our next our next session. Um, Ms. Amador's class and Kimberly are both wondering um, what your favorite fossil is that you've found or what's the coolest fossil you've found so far. And I want to add that, you know, we've, we've talked about a few with you specifically over this past year and maybe one of those is your favorite, but um, I'll let you let us, let us know what your favorite or the coolest one is. 
So I, I will start by saying that, again, we have about 660-ish different animals and plants that we find fossils of here. So it's really hard to pick a favorite. And very commonly, my favorite is the one that I'm currently looking at because I, I just am very excited about the work that we do and all of these like evidence of the past that like sometimes we get to be the first people ever in the history of everything to see this particular fossil. So I love them all. But as Becca, you know, uh, my favorite one of our species is the Capromerix minor, the little dwarf pronghorn, which is a extinct cousin to the pronghorn that still live in the Midwest today. Um, the, the, that look like antelope, but they're not antelope, they're their own separate evolutionary tree. Um, so those are my favorites of our fossils, but at the same time, uh, we did do that one. I got to do that one for Valentine's Day for our fossil finds. Um, but at the same time, I've loved doing this program. Uh, both me and my coworker, Sean, have been taking turns doing this. And both of us have really noticed, like, even though we've been here for so many years and looked at these same animals over and over and over again, this opportunity to learn more about them, to share more about them. I've learned more about snakes over the last month than I can possibly tell you all right now. They're really cool, go do more research. But that's been true for bison and for saber-toothed cats and for pronghorn and for all of the animals that we've done. So it's definitely been one of those things that's really hard to pick a favorite because they've all been fantastic. So, sorry, I don't have a great answer. No, I totally understand. I feel the same way. Every time we've done this, I've just learned so much about all of these animals, even though I work with this material all the time, hearing directly from you and Sean has been so awesome. So thank you so much for sharing your time and energy with us and zooming in to share even more about these fossil finds. Um, as I mentioned earlier, this is our last episode for this school year. Um, so we just want to say thank you for all of you to, for joining us. Um, we've learned so much about snakes from the Ice Age just today. And as Laura mentioned, um, so many other animals this past year. So if you want to see more from our fossil preparators, you can give them a follow on Instagram. They are at the La Brea Tarpets. And we'll also have all of the videos from these presentations on our YouTube channel for you to watch later. You can catch this recording and the one that Laura mentioned on the Capromeric, which is her favorite on our YouTube um, playlist. And as I mentioned, our last episode of Fossil Finds for this school year. So thank you again for joining us this past year. We're excited to take a little break to focus on finding some new fossils to share with you all in the fall. So thank you again. Have a great summer. Hope to see you soon. <laughs>